All right, I mean, we are back. Happy Friday to you and yours out there. This has been a long time coming. I can't believe it's been a year, over a year, since we talked last time. And it's always, always a pleasure to talk to this guy. Welcome back to the show. The OG, the original, Mr. Josie Scott. What's up, brother? How you been, man? What's up, buddy? How you doing, brother? Doing good, man. Doing good. Not as good as you, but I'm getting there. <laughs> I think you're doing. I think you're doing a, a lot better than me. Your 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 show's taking off. You're doing really well. I'm proud of you, man. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. You, you know what? I I I, I'm, I there's so much I want to talk to you about, but something I really, you know, people, I don't think people know or realize this because you know since our interview last year. You know, I kind of got brought into like your personal world because now I'm friends with you on Facebook and your wife. So I see all these things that go on in your real everyday life. And I got to say, honestly, like it's really I'm blown away by it because you can truly see like the love between you and your wife. Like I see it in every picture you guys take. You can just see it in your eyes. And it's very inspiring. <laughs> Yeah, man, she is. Uh, she's she's my everything. You know what I mean. She's my muse, and she's the reason for my songwriting ability. And you know, she makes my heart beat faster and slower at the same time. <laughs> Does you know go, coming back into the, the the music business and the music world, and and just that your your, your songwriting muse is it different now? Because you have that muse and all these years of being together and love compared to the younger Josie that was trying to break into the business? Most definitely. You know, we've been together for 20 years. Uh, we've been uh, married for 19 of those years. Okay. So um, we've, you know, built a life together. You know, we, mm -hmm. we've, uh, we're, we're not only you know, uh, best friends and, uh, marriage partners, uh, you know, and not just lovers, but business partners, you know what I mean? We, we've, I tell, I was telling her the other day, you know, we've, we've built this together, you know, uh, right. a, a lot of men are reluctant to say that, um, their, their wife is worth 50% of them, but I'm, definitely uh not shy to tell you that that my wife is definitely my better half and uh she's because you know i'm i'm more of the creative side of things i i just love to write songs and i love to sing mm -hmm. i've always been a musical kid you know since i was a little kid i used to bang on pots and pans and and then I discovered my voice a few years later. So I started singing and banging on pots of pans. And she's, she's always been really uh, mechanically minded and uh, business minded. And uh, she has a really huge heart. Um, she works with, with children. Okay. And uh, I was telling her over Halloween just to watch her, um, uh, her her company did this big uh, gathering for children they gave out candy and you know had costume contests and all kinds of things like that and just to see the the i call her superwoman you know what i mean she's like wonder woman she she's so kind and and so sweet to the children and has such a tender heart for for the kids but at the same time, she can turn right around and put together, you know, a million dollar business deal wow. and, and, uh, and, and knows every aspect of, of everything. You know, she's just, she, her mind, her wheels are always turning. I think she's just as passionate about business and being an influence on our children and other children. Mm -hmm. as as i am passionate about music wow most definitely what do you think is the secret 
to to your the success of your relationship that you can share with the world and, and maybe I mean because look, there's some marriages that don't last twenty days, let alone twenty years. Yeah, um, I think that you have to uh, make up your mind that this world is going to be set against you mm. and you have to decide and make a commitment to each other beyond your wedding vows to just stay by each other's side wow. and never leave, never waver, never wonder, um, and always have that bond and that trust of we're going to go through the valleys and we're going to go through the peaks, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Together, but we're going to do it together. We're going to do it uh, t together for each other. And we're going to do it together for our children. Um, because, you know, unfortunately in this day and age, man, um, not just marriage, but being together, period, is kind of devalued and uh, not looked at uh, as uh, a viable option, I guess. Right. And it, it, it just is for us, man. It's just the perfect fit for us. She's she's my ride or die. You know what I mean? Uh, I know she's going to stay with me no matter what, and she knows I'm going to stay with her no matter what. And I'm going to pick her up when she falls down and she's going to pick me up when I fall down. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I got to so say, I like, <laughs> again, inspirational, man. You guys are truly are. And pe people need to, uh, see what's going on. I, I just get blown away. I do. Every time I see you guys, I could just, I see the twinkle in both of your eyes. And I'm just like, man, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, man. Ever since, uh, you know, it all started at a saliva show here in Tulsa. Um, we were, have I told you this? I don't think so. Don't or think maybe so. you did. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I did. I don't think I did. Maybe not the whole thing, but we uh, came to a show here in 2003, May 29th, 2003. Um, you know, I had, um, uh, you know, was, uh, had been through the kiss and Aerosmith tour. Mm. And then we were, after that, we were going out on our own and doing some shows, uh, doing some dates, um, uh, by ourselves. And we just did, uh, one of those pop-up shows here in Tulsa, Oklahoma at this place called the voodoo room. It's not even okay. there anymore. It's, um, I think it's the Tulsa theater or something different now. And, um, we w went into soundcheck that day and we hardly ever uh, went into soundcheck because we would just uh, rehearse at the beginning of a tour and okay. our front house guy would set all the sounds and everything then and get it all dialed in and anything beyond that, you know, any anything beyond a few tweaks here and there, we, we, we didn't really go in for sound check, but I remember Scotty Ross, the, the famous tour manager, Scotty Ross, he's worked for like Van Halen and Poison and um, uh, Journey back in the day, uh, back in the early 80s. And he's just a legendary guy in the in the business. And he he came on the bus. And he's got this rough voice. And he said, all right, guys, you're going to have to get your asses up and come in and pretend to sound check because they're, they're playing rest in pieces on the radio here in Tulsa. And I know you assholes haven't played it since you recorded it six months ago. So you got to get your asses in here and learn that song. And he was right. We hadn't, uh, not only was rest in pieces, uh, a, a song that we had not played since we recorded it six six months ago, but it was a Nikki Six songs. Right. So it, it wasn't written by us. So 
we had to go in and, and learn it. Wow. So uh, we go in and we set up and we start uh, practicing rest in pieces. And there she comes. She walks in, man, with with a friend of hers. And I remember leaning over to Wayne Sweeney, God rest his soul, and saying, man, do you see her? And he goes, he goes, yeah, her, which one? <laughs> I said, that one, the only one. Because I don't know, I, I couldn't see anybody but Kendra. It was just like she had this illuminated God light around her. And she just looked like this symmetrical angel surrounded by light. And I just felt like my heart clicked. Like I felt like it was one of those moments in my life where wow. it was just like you, you – Cause I have no, that's another thing. I have no game with women. I have no ability, you know, people, people think, well, you're Josie Scott, man. You are, you know, you, I'm sure you <laughs> mac on chicks and all that stuff. I never was, I never was that guy, man. You know what I mean? I, I definitely, uh, you know, dated around and everything, but I, I never was the guy that just, you know, ran through, a lot of relationships because I'm just people don't believe me, but I'm I was just so painfully shy. You know, I've I've gotten a little better about it. You know, now that I'm I'm a little older uh, or a lot older actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, back then I was just so painfully shy, man. I, I I I didn't know what to do. So we sound checked, and I actually. Uh, turned around and faced the band because she was so beautiful. I could not pay attention to what I was doing. And I had to learn that song still. And I, I, I just turned around and she thought, I found out later on, she thought I was just being like a dick and, <laughs> and just ignoring her or, you know, just being a, a jerk or whatever. But she was just so incredibly beautiful. I could not continue to, stare at her and learn that song so I, I turned around to to have to learn the song but but i was waving at her and you know uh just being a little she calls it me being the little boy that i am you know so <laughs> when i left the uh, sound check that day i got on the bus and i was tripping man i was pacing back and forth and i was like i i, I don't know wayne i was like i, I i've got to go in there and talk to her I was like, I know if I don't go in there and talk to her, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. And he goes, well, go talk to her. I was like, man, I can't, I don't know. I can't, I can't go in there and just start up a conversation. You know what I mean? He goes, why not? I said, I said man, I know. I said, I know I'm, I know I'm going to regret this for the rest of my life if I don't go talk to this girl. So there was a, a, a little girl from the club uh, that was, the runner for that day. And she was okay. there to, you know, take us uh, here and there to like radio interviews and, and different things. And, and she goes, well, why don't you just go with me? She goes, I got to go to Walmart. She goes, why don't you just go to Walmart and grab her a card or something? I was like, you know what? That's not a bad idea. That's kind of forward or whatever, but uh, I'll go get her like a nice little card or something. So we walked into, um, walmart and long story short i saw this beautiful arrangement of roses and i was like you know being a southern boy i was like man red roses is kind of way way forward because i know that means love you know what i mean so i was like should i get yellow roses for friendship but i don't want to be your friend <laughs> so i saw this little bouquet of three roses and I was like, okay, that's, that's perfect. So I just got this little vase and the lady behind the counter was like, you want me to fix them up for you? And I was like, oh yeah, go the whole way. Like she put like baby's breath all around them and put a big <laughs> ribbon and a bow on them and uh, put them in this beautiful vase. And uh, so I went back to the voodoo room and by that time people are starting to line up around the building. And I told our uh, we we had uh, Brett Michaels security guy 
uh, Big John. Big John. With her. And he he was like, uh, I was like, how am I going to get in now? I don't I, I don't want to go out there and, di- and uh, you know, disrupt the line or whatever. Uh, and, you know, try to get in that that back door. And uh, he goes, just just put your hoodie up over your up over your head. I'm going to walk you in there. Just don't worry about it. So <laughs> he pulls my hoodie up over my head and like pulls the string real tight. And he puts a jacket over me and we just run through the the line and we go in and i just i was like okay joseph here here we go you know this is put up or shut up time and i literally they felt like i was gonna throw up i was like (laughs) just with every step i was like just putting one foot in front of the other one i was like just please don't turn around don't stop so i finally walked up and there she was and I just stuck my arm out and I said, hi, I got you some flowers. And she was like, okay. And I said, I just wanted to tell you, you're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And if nobody's told you that today, just try to remember I told you. And she just smiled this beautiful white, big toothy smile and that was it man that that was uh that was the starting that was the starting gun right there and we started talking and she just made me feel so comfortable you know just like when i see her with children because i'm just that's all i am as a big (laughs) child and uh you know she just like she makes children feel instantly comfortable and instantly safe and I just automatically felt comfortable and safe with her. And I still feel the same comfort and safety to this day. Right before I walked out here, I I was talking to her and, uh, you know, we were talking about what we have planned for the day and, and what we're going to do. And, uh, she just has a way, man. She's got a way. And, uh, she just makes me, she just makes me feel safe and she makes me feel, uh, protected and loved and all that good stuff all that warm gushy stuff it's so crazy though to hear and you're not the only one when you hear uh, a person who's that front man lead singer of of, of, uh, a rock band is like really this shy guy (laughs) yeah well and i've met other ones It, it it's encouraging because i've met other guys you know, I won't name them or whatever because I don't want to bust them out. But I've met other gigantic, uh, you know, lead singers a, sure. uh, a lot bigger than 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 myself, and they are, you know, just as shy. And um, you know, in certain situations, it's almost like they. It's almost like a button flips on, mm-hmm. like you know, doing this interview with you or. Uh, going on stage and singing like Josie Scott takes over. Right. And, and that, that switch flips on inside of me and I can be that guy uh, and, and get the information relayed that I need to get out and, or sing the songs that I need mm-hmm. to sing. And I can perform and, and just get down and do a, you know, bombastic show. And I'm, feeling it in my soul because music is such a spiritual experience for anybody not just me and uh you know i believe that music is medicine that, that heals people's broken hearts man and absolutely uh, so that switch just flips on man when i when i'm on stage but off stage man i'm uh, you know joseph I, I go back to being joseph sappington and and you know Justice Sappington is 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 a really shy you know kind of uh, quiet uh, person until you get to know me. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I'm like a little kid. I'm I'm really quiet until you get to know me. Then you can't shut me up. <laughs> uh, well, you you uh, you mentioned Wayne. Uh, we lost Wayne earlier this year. Um, I'm really sorry about that, man. It's, that's a tough blow. Yeah. Um, you uh, you got to reunite and play on stage with them. I guess I guess it was just over a year ago. Yeah, Blue Ridge, man. Uh, you know that was 
the whole reason um, that I, you know, wanted to come back was, you know, he called me and invited me. Uh, he just called me and one day and said, Hey, uh, like six or seven months from now, he goes, you want to come out and, and do a show with us? And I was like, well, what do you mean? You know, cause the reunion had fell through and, mm -hmm. you know, different things had, had not happened and just not manifested. And, you know, it just, it just wasn't, wasn't meant to be, it wasn't in the cards. I don't really believe it was anybody's uh, fault. It just, it just didn't come together. Uh, and then my son passed away and it, my whole world just blew up, uh, after that. And, you know, um, he called me up and, and invited me to do that at Blue Ridge. And, and, uh, I just thought, yeah, you know, if you want me to, I just felt something inside of me going, you need to do this. You need to go do yeah. this. And, you know, I believe that there's that voice inside of us, you know, that, that, that is installed, I believe by our higher power and, and, you know, people call it their gut feeling mm -hmm. or, you know, that premonition that you have, but I just had that, that, that gut feeling, that premonition, uh, to, that I needed to go do this. So I said, yeah, man, heck yeah. Six, I got six months to get ready. And, you know, uh, that's what, that's what really got me got me going and and uh i had recently uh because i was so depressed for a, a long time and you know sure. i was going through mourning the loss of a child uh which i wouldn't wish on anybody my god mm -hmm. um you know as you know i lost my son to covid mm -hmm. in may of 21 and um i just you know was going through this unbelievable cycle of mourning you know I, sure. I would be sad for a, a, a month and then i would be angry for a month and sure. uh, then i would be i'd have this acceptance and this peace about it and then mm -hmm. i would i would go right back through the sadness and you know something a song would come on or, or a picture or a, a, you know he worked uh really closely with FedEx and I'd see a, a FedEx plane or a FedEx truck or something and it would just boil right back up, you know, and, uh, and my wife too, you know, Kendra sure. was, was very, very close with Cody and it devastated her certainly as much as it did me. And, but I had a dream that I was laying on a, the canvas of a boxing ring. Okay. And everything was like sideways, like I was laying, like I was laying down and I was like, what is going on? And I looked at my hands and my hands had boxing gloves on. And I was like, what am I doing? Am I in a boxing ring? And then, and then I felt something running out of my face. And I was like, I was like, that's blood, dude. What? what is, what is going on? I was like, somebody has knocked my out, you know? And I, I just, you know, immediately felt like, oh my God, dude, somebody has just cold cocked me and it's all over with. So, and then right after that, I felt somebody behind me saying, mm -hmm. come on, come on. You got to get up. You got to get up, man. Come on, dude. You got you to gotta get up. And then the voice started to say, come on, pop. Come on, pop. Mm -hmm. Come on, dad. Come on, dad. You got to get up. Come on, pop. You got to get up. And I felt him pulling my collar, my collar like that. And I was like, oh, my God, that's Cody. And I tried wow. to turn around and I woke up, man. Wow. And I just sat on the side of the bed and just kind of cried tears of joy you sure. know what i mean that that i had i had that connection again with my child that i had lost and i had felt for a long time that i wasn't going to do music anymore i wasn't mm -hmm. going to go back and and uh do anything uh with music and you know i was just heartbroken and 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 just heart sick and discouraged and 
the last thing I wanted to do was was go back and and uh, and and do music after after losing my son. I just felt like it would be inappropriate, you know. And but after that dream, I knew that was Cody telling me, yeah. "I'm fine, I'm okay, but you're not okay. You got to get up, and you got to." Mm-hmm. You got to get up and fight, Dad. You got to get up and and get back on the horse, man. You got to get up and dust yourself off, and you got to get your fists up, and you got to continue to fight. And so that's what I did. I uh, I I got you know I joined the gym and immediately uh, started to you know take my health and my uh, fitness journey uh, very seriously and. Uh, you know, Planet Fitness has been so cool about it, and they've they've been with me every step of the way, and been you know super supportive, and and um, you just couldn't ask for better people than than the people at, at Planet Fitness. They've really taken good care of me, and I got in there and um, you know put my nose to the grindstone and uh, started started banging it out in the gym, man, and. Uh, lost 150 pounds before it was over with that's amazing man and uh i even gained some muscle i i i got i got down to a certain weight and then i started to to uh put a couple of pounds back on and the 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 trainer at the gym was, told me he goes yeah you're put you're putting on muscle man you're starting to you got to break the house down he said and then you build the house back up from the ground up and and so that's what i've been doing i uh you know tore it down by losing the losing the weight uh the 150 pounds and now i'm building the house back up with muscle training and uh uh, tension and resistance training and um you know i I tell my daughters that i lost uh i lost 150 pounds I, i lost something bigger than them you know i lost <laughs> the size of them <laughs> what really i i keep seeing because you're you always wear like you're wearing now the the big adidas jacket uh especially when you're on stage and i keep waiting for uh, the one day you're going to take that jacket off and i literally just saw a picture of rick springfield the other day without a shirt on and he's like 72 73 years old and he's ripped and i'm like that's going to be josie <laughs> he looks so good man doesn't Rick Springfield look so good? That's crazy. Amazing. Amazing. I couldn't believe it. When I saw that picture, I was like, whoa, how'd that happen? <laughs> yeah, man. He's he's awesome. He is, man. I, I saw him in concert like 10 years ago. I was like, great, great stuff, man. So he, he wrote a, a song about his dad passing away uh, called uh, Daddy Knows the Great Unknown. And it is like, such like a, that, yeah. a beautiful tribute to his dad. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I got to write that down because I'm going to, I got to check that out. I'll probably end up sitting and crying. Yeah, it's a beautiful tribute to his father. So one thing, uh, if people go back and they watch those old saliva videos, there's always muscle cars in the videos. Did you ever go and buy yourself one of those muscle cars with a with a big royalty check you got? <laughs> I did, man. I I was not very smart with uh I've never been very good with money. Um but one one morning I just got on a, a tangent and like you said I had never seen that much money before and uh uh, you know, grew up, we all grew up in Memphis, you know, kind of poor, mm-hmm. lower middle class. And, uh, you know, we had never seen any kind of money like that. None of us had. And so I, I was a big fan. I was a huge fan of auto trader. So I would, <laughs> I'd get in there and search through the cars. And, I used to uh, buy them every week just to look at the cars. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I got, uh, I, my first one I was I bought my dream car was a seventy two Nova. Wow. I wanted a, a black seventy two Nova with uh chrome craggers around it. And I had to actually get the mechanic in Memphis 
to remove the seat and build an extra couple of inches on the uh, railing for the seat. So the seat would actually go back far enough for me to be able to fit in the car, you know, cause I'm a, at that time was, a, was a bigger guy than I am now, but I've always been six, three, you know, and, uh, pretty tall and my arms are really long. And so he readjusted the seat for me and welded it in there. And, uh, so the Nova 72 Nova was my first one. And then, the, you know, once you get started, they're like Lay's potato chips. You can't, you can't eat just one. So I ended up getting, uh, 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 the bandit car, the, the 78 Trans Am. I'd always wanted that one. And, um, uh, I got, um, uh, my favorite car was the 1975 Pontiac Granville convertible. Ooh. Uh, that was that was less a muscle car and more of just a pimping ass cruising car, you oh. know. <laughs> and, uh, me and Kendra used to. It had these. It was like lipstick red, man, and but the interior was white leather, and it had that beautiful white vinyl top, and the white vinyl top would go back like this, and we would just. I'd put my arm around her, pull her up close to me, and we'd just cruise around in that. Pontiac Granville, man. I love that car. That's awesome. So uh, how about um, another thing is like I've noticed during your live set now that you're doing, you're actually throwing some cover songs in there and paying a little tribute to uh, Taylor Hawkins, I noticed too. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, the first time I went and seen him was uh, I took my little cousin Amy uh, God rest her soul. Um, I went to a concert at uh, the Pyramid in Memphis. It was an Alanis Morissette concert on the Jagged okay. Little Pill tour. And I was like, man, who is that blonde hairball playing drums? Because this kid was just, it. he looked like Animal from the Muppets. Dude. He was just... <laughs> eating this drum set alive the whole show he was just so you know just bombastic and charismatic and just played the fattest freaking beats man and he was his timing was unbelievable you know he's one of those drummers that just has perfect metronome timing and uh, i was like who is this guy so i searched out uh I don't even think we had Google at the time. I had to really do my homework and figure out who this guy was. And I found out it's, you know, of course, Taylor Hawkins. And then, you know, I started to follow his career a little bit. And, you know, uh, after, you know, Kurt Cobain died, uh, of course, Dave Grohl's new band, Foo Fighters, was my favorite band, man. Mm -hmm. They still are one of my favorite bands of all time. Absolutely. And so once they got Taylor, I was like, oh, shoot, this is about <laughs> to be on. This is about to be on right here. So, um, and I knew that, you know, Dave, I, or I had heard that Dave was struggling with drummers and, you know, going in in the middle of the night and playing, playing drum parts over and all kinds of crazy stuff. So I knew he wasn't, as a fan, I knew he probably wasn't completely sold or happy with who he had playing drums you know no no shade against them but he just was he just knew how he wanted it to be and if mm -hmm. he had to do it himself he was he was gonna do it so i i thought he's finally got somebody that he's gonna trust to play these drum parts the way they are meant to be played and the way he hears them in his head but i knew that was gonna happen when he got taylor and uh it just uh, was another shattering death, man, was was another death that just broke my heart, you know, just like Kobe Bryant broke my heart, you know. Um, we've lost so many people, uh, not just to COVID, but, you know, just. Tragic. You know, Tra tragic. Just, any, any more. It's like every day you turn around, like, like the other day with Matthew Perry. And oh, like no. Oh, that broke my heart when I heard about that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and it's, 
people are Steve angry. Riley. Yeah, Steve Riley. Yeah, that broke my heart too. It is. It, I mean, with all all these losses that we all experience, whether it's personal or um, you know people like uh, Taylor Hawkins or Steve Riley, when you think about it in your own mortality, is there something like you say to yourself, like? from a professional standpoint, musically, that you want to make sure you accomplish before, God forbid, it's your time? That's a good question, man. And, you know, I think we all absolutely, you know, consider our our own mortality, you know, when something like that happens. And uh, like Hank Williams said, none of us get out of this world alive. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I think as as musicians uh, and entertainers, we're afforded the luxury and the responsibility of being immortal mm. when, it, when it comes to our music. So I want to always be cognizant of that. And I want to leave a legacy, not only for my children, but I want to leave a body of work for the fans uh, to hold on to, you know, I want them, uh, to be able to refer back to these songs. Like I refer back to, you know, Fleetwood Mac or James Brown or, uh, old kiss records or old ACDC records or, uh, any of the things or beastie boys, you know, any of the things that really touched me, I want them to be able to, to, I want to leave a body of work, uh, and, you know, a, a, a legacy of work that they can uh, refer back to. And and uh, like Dick Clark says, music is the soundtrack of our lives. Mm. So I want to I want to be able to, to touch people with music like that. That's all I ever wanted. That's awesome. How, how about like who? who um for some reason, I was just thinking, like, as you're mentioning these artists, is there people that in your younger days you didn't give a chance to musically? And now as you've gotten older, you're like, you go back and you're like listening because it, it's happened to me. Like lately, like, you know, I was like a casual, like if they came on the radio, Leonard Skinner. Like, ah. But now, like, I dive in and I'm like, wow, Skinner yeah. is amazing. The sweet uh, Sinatra. Dean Martin, like I go back and I'm listening to all this stuff now, Frankie Valley, and I just, I just love music. And, and like you said, like all these amazing catalogs and bodies of work. Is there anybody that recently you've hung on to, like, oh my, like, I, why did I give this a chance? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, all of that stuff that I grew up on that I have never really talked about. Uh, in interviews, you know, because when somebody asks you who your influences are, you know, I've, I've gone through the list of uh, the usual suspects like ACDC, Beastie Boys, Run DMC, Rage Against the Machine, um, Foo Fighters, you know, all those bands uh, were, were huge influences on my life. But you're totally right, man, especially with the advent of something like Spotify. Mm -hmm. I just sit here and I'll go down the rabbit hole, man, and I'll, <laughs> I'll listen to old Bar K's records and I'll get into the Temptations. And mm -hmm. uh, then uh, I was listening to Hall and Oates the other day. My uh, Philly boys. <laughs> I, I seen that uh, movie. Have you seen that movie? The, uh, the, uh, that the new movie, uh, uh, No Hard Feelings. No, it's got uh, that Jennifer uh, chick in it from uh, uh, from Hunger Games. I can't remember her last. Okay, name. Uh, Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence, yeah, and uh, it's her. It's her new movie, and there's a, a part in the movie where this kid that she's uh, on a date with uh, knows how to play piano and they're in a restaurant and she ags him on and ags him on to go play a song. She's like, go play a song for me. Play one for me. 
So he goes, oh, God, okay. So he goes up to the piano, this beautiful black grand piano, and he plays this version of Man Eater by Hall and Oates that just killed, dude, just murdered me. <laughs> really? And I was I, not expecting I, you to say that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, man, I think I, I want to cover this song, man. This this is an awesome song. You know what I'm saying? And uh, and and that just, you know, took me down the Hall and Oates rabbit hole. And just uh, Depeche Mode is another one, man, that I've, that I've, and I've always been a Depeche Mode fan, but I have never really done a deep dive on Depeche Mode. You know, R.E.M. is another one. Um, um, Tears for Fears. My God, what a just ridiculous body of work, man. When I was a kid, I, I actually, when I was going through uh, wrestling school to become a professional wrestler, I worked in a frame shop, framing paintings and pictures and stuff. And it was all like artsy people I worked with. And all they played was R.E.M. Before Losing My Religion came out, like in their early days. And I hated R.E.M. But when Losing My Religion came out, like it was killing me. I'm like, this is probably one of the most perfect songs ever written. And it right. killed me to like it. But I love that song. And then I became a fan of R.E.M. because of that song. Oh, my gosh. I love that song so much, too, man. Just just a masterpiece uh absolute absolute masterpiece man so, well so, so, speaking of influences and all something too and i had texted you when it happened it was earlier this year i was at a, the rocking pod convention here in nashville and um stevie rochelle from the band tough and who also runs the metal sludge website he was on stage doing a panel talking with um the guys from uh, decibel decibel geek podcast and he was telling a story about you as he was uh I guess he was at a sh saliva show or somewhere where you were and um he's like you know, saliva's coming up and they're blowing up on the charts and they're this new hot band and and he said lead singer josie scott he said he didn't have to give me the time of day he goes at that time he goes you know people looked at bands the hair bands and all that stuff like the plague like get away from us get away from us he said but josie was so such a beautiful person and just talked me up and how he was a fan and loved tough and the generation and, and the music and how inspirational and he's like i'll never forget that and that's and i texted you i'm like and i sent your picture i'm like you're being talked about right now man you're being praised man that's awesome dude well i've just i don't know man I, i've just always been such a, a huge uh student of, uh, you know, entertainers and uh, entertainment and, mm -hmm. and uh, not just the music, because the music is going to touch your soul. You know, you, you know, you know, that's, you know, where that's where, where that's going. And you, you know that that's going to give you goosebumps on your goosebumps. You know what I mean? Uh, but I've always been a, a, a fan and a student of of entertainers as well, man. And, and, you know, he's, he's certainly a, a great example of that. And, you know, uh, I, I've, one time we were playing a show, I think we were in Europe and we were playing with Stone Temple Pilots and one of the biggest thrills in my life was I turned around and my, I saw my beautiful wife standing on the side of the stage watching the show and right over her left shoulder was Scott Weiland standing there watching the show. And I was just like, wow. Oh my God. 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 <laughs> and you know, um, just uh, trying to hold it together and not totally fanboy out, you know, uh, was a was a challenge for me because I was such a huge Stone Temple Pilots fan mm -hmm. uh, and such a DeLeo Brothers fan. Yeah. Um, just uh, their writing style and and how just a, what amazing musicians and entertainers they were, and yeah. Scott just being the icon that he already was, you know, just the living legend that he already was at that time. 
and to see him take the time to come out and watch little old saliva, man, I was just like, wow, that is awesome, dude. That is. I got to, I got to see uh, Scott and Dean do a little unplugged thing for a radio station for like oh, twenty wow. people, and I mean I was a huge fan before that, but after I saw that, that dude had the voice of an angel. I, oh, I don't think people cool. really realize how amazing he was. Yeah. It's so, such right. a great stage presence too, man. Oh, unbelievable! Unbelievable. So the music. The new music. What's going on with it? Well, actually, when we again when we talked last year, I'm pretty sure it was actually off the air. You were telling me about a song you were you kept coming to Nashville and you had like your first single, you were all, all picked out and all ready to go. What's up with that? Is that still a go? I know recently you said you're gonna do more of a country style. So what's going on musically? Well, you know, I've just you know, I've I've sort of wanted to it's it's taken me a minute to 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 get my feet wet again you know to get back in the business and to to get back out there and and begin doing shows and um you know with with wayne's passing uh and uh, i changed management uh Mm -hmm. Uh, a year ago today, actually, me and you uh, spoke the the day that happened. Uh, oh wow! <laughs> going through, yeah, going okay. through, uh, going through a management change, and uh, and with Wayne's passing, there, there's just been a lot of, and I've had a, a I've lost a, a lot of family members uh, since then. Uh, there's just been so much going on in my in my personal life with sure. uh, w- with uh, so much loss and and uh, you know uh, some business things that that have been going mm-hmm. on in my life and, and just being a dad you know uh, mm-hmm. raising three three kids my son Justice is 17 and uh, my daughter Jordan is uh, 12 and my my baby Jolie is eight years old or nine years old she she's about about to turn well no she's about to turn nine years old this month on around thanksgiving and you know being being just being a a father and a husband and um you know trying to get you know keep the house in in order and and Mm -hmm. uh up and running um, has been a challenge you know so i but i've continued to write writing has never been a choice for me. It's just something that, that is, it's just something that happens. I call it the, the radio in my, in my head. <laughs> and I, luckily I've documented all these ideas and, and all these songs. Um, I, and as far as doing, you know, uh, doing country or rock or, or whatever, I've always been all those things. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've just recently taken the bridle off of myself, so to speak. And I don't want to, to saddle myself. I can't, I hate using all these, uh, equestrian, uh, references, but, uh, I don't want to, to saddle myself with one genre. You know, I've never been, uh, just a heavy metal guy, uh, mm-hmm. or, uh, and not just a hard rock guy, but I, I also love uh, country music, you know. And I also love Frank Sinatra, like you said, mm-hmm. Dean Martin and, and jazz. I love Miles Davis and I love uh, soul music. I love James Brown and I mm-hmm. love the Temptations. And I just want to do uh, an album and albums that embody all those influences i don't want to love it. To, to be saddled to to one to one box i want to i want to use all the crayons to color you know what i mean and uh i i'm i i think there's no wine before it's time you know what i mean so i've just i've just really i've i've not tried to pressure myself um and i i've spoken to bob marlette about 
uh, doing some stuff together, um, as well as doing some stuff with Scatterbrains from uh, Nashville. Uh, he's he's me and him are recording some stuff together. He's an amazing producer as well. Um, but yeah, I, I just I'm just taking my time. You know, I'm I I don't want to rush it. Uh, I've been going out and doing some uh, some Josie Scott. Um, you know, voice of saliva type shows and, mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to get re- reacquainted with the fans and let them know that I'm, I'm, I'm back out there, you know, and, uh, I just don't want to rush it. I want it to be, I want it to be perfect, especially in the, in the day and age when, you know, you don't have to necessarily release a full album's worth of material. You can just drop a single. Exactly. And, uh, so I, I, I got, I got in the studio and, uh, and did that song with uh, Silent Theory. Did you hear that one? Yes. And uh, so, you know, that that gave me a, a little taste of getting back in the studio. Um, and that was thanks to Paul Crosby, my, my drummer, uh, ex-drummer from Saliva. Uh, he got me involved. He's managing that band. Okay. Uh, actually, and he got me back into that. But, um, you know, I don't want to, I, I just don't want to rush myself uh Bay, I want to, I want to take my time and, and, uh, take my, take my Tennessee time doing it. <laughs> I, I think that's the, that's, you know, as crazy and uh, I don't even know if you want to say it, there's a true music business today, you know, when it comes to making music. Um, but I think that's the good part of it where especially when you're not tied to a label like back in the day yeah you had to be in that pigeonhole genre of this hard rock heavy metal saliva but now you can be yourself whatever right. you're feeling if you want to make a country song you make a country song if you want to make a sinatra style song you can do that if you want to do metallica you can do that it's whatever your heart feels i think that's the beautiful thing of the music business today that you can just you know, look look at a guy like Jelly Roll, who's you know one minute he's doing a hip hop song, the next minute he's doing these beautiful soulful tunes. So it's a it's an amazing thing right now. Yeah, and and you know Jelly is good a good friend of mine, and and watching his career uh, take off and explode like it has has just been amazing, and I'm so happy for him and proud for him. You know, he's one of the sweetest most genuine just you he you you see what you get with him you know he 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 is what he is there is not one ounce of fakeness or um condescension or any kind of attitude or anything from him he is one of the kindest sweetest most charitable human beings that walks the face of this earth man and we are blessed to have him we are blessed to be in his presence he is an extraordinary extraordinary young man and i'm just so proud and thankful and grateful to have have a cat oh and we lost josie Uh oh. Hopefully his battery didn't die. Let's see. Will he come back? Come on back, brother. Come on back. We'll give it a few minutes. It's uh it's it's pretty crazy though just to um we're talking about Jelly Roll. He, uh, Jelly, I live right where uh, Jelly Roll is from in the part of Nashville, and he's doing a um, toy drive tomorrow at the local Walmart. And he's actually, I'm pretty sure he's actually even performing live at the Walmart. So I'm sure it's going to be a zoo uh, tomorrow at Walmart in Antioch. <laughs> so, uh, all right, let's, uh, we'll give. Josie a few more minutes. If not, make sure you check out his website, josiescottrocks.com, where you can keep up to date on him, get all the tour dates. He is out there on tour. He's been doing a lot of shows almost every weekend. He's out there 
doing a little run of shows. So let's see. I'll give it, give it a few, give it a few. Otherwise, you just hear me rambling on. You don't, you don't want to hear me rambling on, do you? <laughs> I'll give it one more minute, and then I'll hop off here. I have a feeling maybe his battery died on his phone. Maybe he wasn't plugged in. Because we were talking for almost an hour. All right, so go, like I said, go to the website. Check them out, josiescottrocks.com. And also follow them on all the social medias, Facebook, Instagram. I think that's going to be it. I think we lost them for good. All right, Josie, I hope you're all right, brother. I'll reach out to you. <laughs> Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Um, go check him out on the website. If he comes to a town near you, go out and check him out. I got I got to like break his stones. He hasn't come to Nashville yet. He comes to Nashville to record, but he hasn't played yet live. What's up, Josie? Come on. Come play live for us. So, all right. Until, uh, until next time, stay tuned. I'm sure Josie will come back on at some point uh, in the future. We'll talk more. Get more updates. Find out about the new music when it's up. Oh, wait. Let's see. He's back. Look at that. I was almost getting ready to sign off. <laughs> oh, man. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened, dude. I was thinking maybe your phone died. The battery died. No, I've got it plugged. I've, I've got it uh, plugged into the charger. Damn. It, just bla it just blacked out. <laughs> wouldn't be an interview with me if there wasn't technical difficulties though <laughs> but i uh you we were, you were talking about jelly roll the funny thing is and you were saying how charitable he is so i i where i live the part of nashville i live in is where he's from and mm -hmm. he's doing a toy drive tomorrow toy afternoon drive, yep. at the local that. at the walmart around the corner from my house <laughs> that's awesome yeah man yeah him and, him and him and struggle jennings both are just some of the kindest, sweetest, salt of the earth, good people, man. They're, they are good people. Like if, if I was, if I was in trouble or if I just needed a friend and, and was, you know, in, in, in really dire straits, mm -hmm. I, I would, I would contact Jelly Roll or I wow. would contact, I would contact Struggle Jennings and uh scatterbrains is the same the same way man he lives there in nashville too those three guys and they're all best friends and they are just some of the kindest warmest most genuine like i said salt of the earth type fellas that you will ever meet in your life and they are 100 percent authentic and real you, you what you see is what you get that's awesome that is awesome. Does it kind of shock you too that, like, you know, being the fact that your your music uh, heyday was, you know, fifteen years ago, and then you got Jelly Roll, who's like the new kid on the block, who's blowing up now, has welcomed you with open arms, not only just musically, but like you're saying, as a friend. Yeah, man, it, it's you know. I'm just, you know, I, I became a fan first of, of him and Struggle uh, and Scatterbrains, uh, you know, became a, uh, I became a fan first and then uh, went down to, to record with uh, Struggle. I had been talking to Struggle a little bit online and, you know, we kind of, we kind of became friends on Instagram and, uh, you know, he invited me to, to come down there and, and record some stuff with him and, um, you know, getting to meet him in the studio and, and being a fan first, you know, I was kind of nervous, uh, 
to 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 meet him and he was just so kind and so amazing and, and uh they they just kind of welcomed me into their into their circle and then uh the first time i met jelly was at a shine down show mm-hmm. uh here in uh tulsa at uh rocklahoma they were okay. playing rocklahoma and um you know, I've been good friends with Zach Myers my whole life. I grew up with Zach Myers, a uh, guitar player for Shinedown. And he, uh, hit, uh, one of our friends that does pyro for uh, Shinedown is a, a good friend of mine from back in Memphis, Matt Healy. And Matt Healy walks up to me. Uh, he goes, did you get your, your tickets and your passes? I said, yeah. And I had my son, Justice, with me. He goes, uh. He goes, you, you know you're going on stage, right? I said, what? He goes, <laughs> he goes, yeah, they they uh they want you to come out and do Simple Man, uh, uh by Skinner, and I was like, uh, uh, uh. I was like, who wants me? And, and he goes, uh, well, you going you you're gonna come out uh with uh Brent and uh Brent's gonna bring you and Jelly out. I was like, Jelly Roll. He goes, yeah. I was like, oh my god. So like, I was like calling my wife, and I was like, the, I was like, I, I'm gonna get to go on stage and, and and do Simple Man with Brent Smith and Jelly Roll and Shine Down. And I was like, I'm so, I was like, I'm freaking out. I'm so excited. And so I look up. The I know that song backwards and forwards. Every Southern boy knows that song. So, but I'm so nervous. I was looking it up on Google, like going through the lyrics. I was like, oh God, I got to get these lyrics perfect. I'm so nervous. Oh God, I hope I haven't. And I hadn't been on stage in, you know, uh, five or six years. So I was like, man. But, you know, when I met him and, uh, we rehearsed it a couple of times backstage. I actually saw a video of that. Yeah. Yeah. With, with Zach and, you know, he just totally made me feel comfortable and, you know, he was just so, he's just so down home and he's got that Tennessee thing that all Tennessee boys have. And it just, he just made, he just instantly made me feel comfortable and like I just like I was at home with me and him were backstage putting our ears on. And he goes, man, these ears are good. You, can, have you heard from these yet? I was like, damn, they are, they do sound good, man. And, uh, we just started chopping it up together, man. And, and, uh, but now every time he sees me, he's like, Hey, Josie, <laughs> uh, he's, he's just such a, a sweet guy. Him and him and struggle and, uh, scatterbrains, all three of them. I can't say enough good things about them. That's awesome. I love those guys. Well, I can't say enough good things about you, Josie. Well, you are amazing, Bay. Thank you so much for having me today. Always, man. Always. I look forward. Okay. I, I, I was just saying this as you blacked out for a few minutes. You come to Nashville and all the time, you're, you're doing music, you're hanging out with Struggle, you're working on stuff and this and that. When are you going to play in Nashville? I'm trying to get some shows uh, scheduled right now. We're we're doing a a tour coming up uh, next year with uh, Tantric and Trapped and okay. Edema. So okay. we're we're definitely going to be coming through Nashville. I I am sure of it. Cool, cool, cool. Especially playing with with Tantric. You know me and Hugo got to come through Nashville. <laughs> my my boys were playing with Hugo for years, and uh, they never once. I, I just talked to uh, Jaron, who's now playing with George Lynch, and he's like, "Yeah, he goes, you know, we, I played with uh, Hugo and Tantric for like two, three years. We never hit Nashville once." <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow, that's surprising yeah. to me. He's all Hugo's always in Nashville. Yeah, they were always in Nashville, but never. Once played, I, I've been I've been living here for four years, and uh, yeah, from the time Jaron and Sebastian were playing with Hugo, they never. So once what played brought Nashville. what brought you to Nashville? I found my Kendra. 
Oh, okay. The All same, right. the same story, kind of, but in a in a different realm. Pretty, it's a wow. pre, it's a pretty crazy, mind blowing story. One day I'll tell you. It's crazy. Well, it's I'd too crazy to believe. I'd love to hear it. it, it it's a funny so, one. <laughs> what, so, what, what's your what's your take on wrestling these days? I don't watch it. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Yep. None. Because none at all. I I like I get crazy because when I start watching it, then it's like. I'm like, why are you doing this? It don't make no sense. And then I like. You start the, picking it apart. I start picking it apart. And the booker and promoter in me that I ended up going into, then I start getting like, all right, well, like I need to start running shows. And I need to promote shows and I need to do this and do that. And it's just, it's better for me to stay away. So the only, in, <laughs> I actually started doing a, a reaction channel where I'm watching the history of ECW TV and talking oh, about wow. that. So that's my touch on that and actually I, I do like podcast interviews for wrestling shows and stuff like that i get called on to and that's it but you know my boys uh the dudleys are over in uh, impact wrestling tna and my one dudley brother's working behind the scenes and so yeah i uh, I, I hear little tidbits here and there from peeps well i'm a huge stone cold steve austin fan so i like did a deep dive the other day uh I, I'm a dude, religious YouTuber, mm-hmm. and That's all I watch I, anymore. I, I, me too, and I just sit and watch, uh, you know, watch this biography. And me and him uh, became friends, and uh, he used to call me. Uh, I, I think it was an old phone number of mine, but he would call and he'd be like, "Josie, it's Stone Cold Steve Austin riding around my neighborhood on four wheeler." Doing a security check, Jack and Coke. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Click, and they just leave. Just leave these random messages about him riding around doing a security check in his neighborhood. <laughs> and I just love that guy, man. He's so he's he's so funny and and uh, so cool. When I was um, when when I was, got started in the business, was the same exact time. Steve was coming out of wrestling school in in Dallas. And I was seeing all the stuff in the magazines that was going on because he got put into this great feud. It was a teacher versus student feud. And then he ended up getting together with uh, his teacher's ex-wife they brought in. And and then he ended up actually getting in a relationship with her. It was a whole crazy thing. So I followed Steve from day one. And then when Steve walked through the dressing room door to be part of ECW when I was there, I was like, here we go. And um, I used to purposely, um, we were doing our TV tapings. You know, everybody would be gathered around the monitor watching what's going on on the other side of the curtain. And I would purposely always sit wherever Austin was sitting. And he would always sit with Mick Foley. Because at the time, they both were getting their offers from Vince to go up to WWE. So they were right. like sitting doing their talks like, I don't know. I'm scared. What should I do? Is they were scared to make that leap because of you know Vince Land and Vince, and so I would like purposely just sit there and eavesdrop and <laughs> listen to their conversations. Yeah, we got to uh, saliva. We got to do a a, a lot of songs. Uh, mm-hmm. Not 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 only do uh, uh, we did the Dudley Boys theme song get the tables and uh, we did uh, Batista's theme song uh, I wrote that in the studio um, in LA and uh, so we we used to work with uh, that Jim Johnston was the musical director guy okay and he, he's not there anymore I heard but uh, he was he was like he's the one that wrote Stone Cold Steve Austin's theme that glass breaking and yeah yeah dun, 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 dun. he's all about them drop d riffs and uh so we our music just fit like a glove with everything he was doing so uh, i think we were the only band to get to do like three wrestlemanias in a row 
uh, as oh, far yeah. as the theme song, we we had uh, Click Click Boom was one of them, and then uh, I believe uh, Superstar was one of them, and then Ladies mm-hmm. and Gentlemen was one of them. So uh, yeah, we got to we got to uh, to do a lot of cool stuff with with uh, WWE. Did you like when things like that happen? Do you see like a huge boost in like like at that time it was record sales, but you see a boost of record sales like because now you have kind of like this outside. It's not your everyday fan stumbling across your music. It's these this whole other world of entertainment that's like, oh, what is this? Oh, absolutely, man, absolutely. When we played WrestleMania 18, uh, there's a video of it on uh, on YouTube, and we came out and played Superstar. <laughs> And I remember they did not warn me that we were surrounded by pyro. I, I didn't know. I knew there was going to be pyro going off uh, up around, you know, the entrance where the wrestlers, the ramp where the wrestlers walk in. But I had no idea that there was going to be pyro just pretty much right next to us, man. And that I was already ner- nervous because it's 90,000 people, you know, in the Sky Dome and, you know, like how many i don't know how many millions of people on pay-per-view so i was like oh fellas oh this is like strap yourselves in boys this is the big time right here and uh so when we uh started doing the song i was like okay we're off and running everything's cool josie just get through the song just sing the song don't mess up the lyrics perform (laughs) it correctly and it'll all be over in just a minute and then them damn them damn uh, pyro bombs started going off, man. And I'm telling you, Bay, it felt like the skin on, like, I must have had, like, you talk about goosebumps on your goosebumps, dude. It's <laughs> it scared me to death. It sounded like a damn war zone. I can only imagine. But That's I wouldn't take nothing for that, man. It was that was really cool to get to do that. That's awesome stuff. Yeah, man. I, I mean, uh, that that was a big thing of ECW too. Like, ECW really turned that whole musical because the, they ECW made the music, the entrance music, and everything, and even doing like the vignettes and all that with music made it so important uh, to put the characters and the angles and everything over, and then. WWE took that whole idea and ran with it and just took it to another yeah. level. They were uh, showing uh, in Stone Cold's biography, they were showing how, you know, they were trying to do this angle and that angle and they were presenting him as as this type of character and then they'd yeah. do this type of character and they just weren't finding a, a good fit for him and uh, he said his wife made him some tea one day and set the cup down in front of him and, and she put some like honey and uh, whatever uh, in the tea and she was stirring it. She said, drink, drink your tea. She said, before it gets stone cold. Mm. And they both looked at each other and he goes, and his wife looked at him and said, that's going to be your name, stone cold. And that's how they came up with it. And then it showed uh, he had a bout with Jake the Snake Roberts. And uh, uh, Jake the Snake was like, before the thing, he was like, I'm I'm praying that, that God will help me to beat Stone Cold Steve Austin. And uh, he was like putting God in it and all this. And... Uh, Stone Cold came out there and said, your prayers ain't going to work or something. And he goes, Austin 316, just, uh, just, he just ad-libbed a line. He goes, Austin 316 says, I'm going to whoop your ass. <laughs> and dude, after that, like the crowd went absolutely ballistic. Yeah. And then he said the next phone call he got was from the t-shirt guy saying uh so uh stone cold we're finally gonna make you a t-shirt 
and, uh, he goes he goes i think it's just gonna say austin 316 and then after that ever like that shirt was everywhere dude like literally everywhere it, it's crazy too because now where he got to ad lib that that's very rare because most of the stuff now is it's so scripted. yeah they have like you know, a team of like 30, 40 TV script writers writing that stuff for those guys every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another reason why I don't watch it. <laughs> it's, it's, right. <laughs> but it, it was crazy to, to, to see how that played out, you know. And I always wondered the what the backlash would be of, you know, even though it was just a gimmick and everything, I, I always wondered what the backlash would be, uh, you know, from – from the religious community and he said that he had he'd see preachers and and priests and stuff in the airport and be like man uh, i'm I'm sorry if y'all are mad because of my t-shirt or whatever and and he said you know that he saw a couple of them and and they would never they were never mad at him they were they were just fans you know uh but it was it was funny to see how he was wondering about that too so that's fine. But I'm a I'm a big I'm a big Stone Cold fan, man. I love Stone Cold. Steve Austin. I, I like 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 I said, like every moment of his career, I was a huge fan from day one, all through his yeah. uh, WCW days and you know Hollywood Blondes days with Pillman and yeah. great stuff. And great he, stuff. he took he took some bad falls, man, and and uh, um he did uh, he was uh, I think he got. Pile dropped one time and, and mm-hmm. busted a, his neck, busted a vertebrae in his neck. Yeah, and like couldn't feel his arms and uh, like was in bad shape for for a second, man. And had to, he said he had to re- relearn, like do all kinds of physical therapy and relearn how to use his arms and hands mm-hmm. and stuff. And he still, he said he still can't lift his leg like a normal person throws a kick or whatever. He has to lift his leg with his hip. And uh, and he was talking about every time he kicked, um, uh, he, every every time he kicked a a, a boy from uh, the CEO from WWE, every time he he kicked him in in the balls, he or every time he was supposed to kick him in the in the stomach, but he would end up kicking him in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that was I I, ne- I didn't even do McMahon, a third. Yeah, Mc, yeah, McMahon, Vince. Every time he kicked. Vince in the in the in the stomach, he end up kicking him in the balls because he couldn't lift his leg. I, I didn't even do like a, not even like a, maybe not even a tenth of what like a guy like Austin has done in the wrestling business. And even like when I stand up and move, it like I'm like like it takes a bit yeah. to get going. Like my one knee is always numb. I can't even get on my knees. It's impossible. Like so. Guys like that who did so much more, I can't even imagine what their bodies are like. Right, I can't, dude. I'm so thankful to to just have the fitness left that I have. I think if I had not lost that weight, I'd probably be in pretty bad shape right yeah. now because okay. um, it it's totally revolutionized. Uh, how I get around and get up and down. I'm, I, I'm not out of breath when I go up a flight of stairs anymore. And uh, so going to the gym has just been paramount for me, man. It's just been, and it's helped my mental health so much, man. Anybody out there, anybody out there that that is wondering how much uh, going to the gym uh, or or just moving, getting up and moving mm-hmm. and doing some walking or some running every day affects your not just your physical body in, in a in a amazing way but it helps your mental health so much man i i became addicted to it i'm still addicted to the gym man i'm a total that's gym awesome. right now i love the gym that's awesome what, what do you like you want a treadmill bike stairs I do, or I, all of it I, I try to do eight to ten miles on the treadmill at least four times a week uh, and then I take uh, w- uh, Wednesday and f- uh, Friday and Saturday off, or I'm sorry, Saturday and Sunday off. 
and but I try to I try to do that at least four times a week. Get in there and do my eight to ten miles, and then I like I said I do the strength training and I do a little lifting and uh, uh, some resistance training and uh, like like Ar- oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger says it's it's about it's not about how much you lift it's about how you lift it and yeah. how much resistance you use going up and controlling it going down um but yeah that the resistance training has really helped me a lot to build muscle and to um uh, to really just change my body completely that's awesome yeah you look great man i'm proud of you thank you brother thank you you can see, you can definitely see like in your face and everything thank you i appreciate it you the man josie Thank Even you, though it, it, it's still like you're the man, babe. <laughs> you still uh, the man, babe. when I when I see that always it, when it was you and I, I saw too. I was like going through like videos and stuff. And I saw Wayne was a big Raiders fan too. What's with the Raiders? Like the Raiders you, I broke my heart as a kid when you beat my Eagles in the Super Bowl, and I've been scarred ever since by that. <laughs> <laughs> I've just uh, I've just always been. Uh, I'm a fan of a, of a lot of teams in the NFL, but I've just always been a big Raiders fan because the black and silver colors, man, black and silver has always been my favorite colors. Like everything I have owned is, is always black and silver, man. All my jewelry and I don't know if you can see it, but yeah. all the jewelry I wear is all black and silver. I've always been a big black and silver fan. The Raiders are all about that black and silver. And that's always been Wayne's Wayne's uh, icon. His emblem has always been that. And I, I wear it out of respect and love for Wayne Sweeney. That's awesome. Well, Josie, again, you're the man. I love talking to you. We could talk all day. Absolutely, man. I love talking to you too, babe. And I'd love to be back sometime. Yeah, man. Keep in touch and uh, – when you come to Nashville, let's uh, you know, let's get together. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, it's a date. Everybody, go to josiescottrocks.com for all the information, tour dates. He's coming to a city near you very soon, and at some point, he's going to blow us away with new music. And you never know what kind of genre it's going to be. It's going to be whatever he's feeling in his heart. Absolutely. Any final words? Man, just uh, love, peace, and chicken grease, baby. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) 